Turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. So we read Galatians 5, 1 through 15 today. What does it mean to have freedom in Christ? Have you ever thought about that? Freedom in Christ. What does that mean for you and for me? And so we're going to look at this uh, very significant passage in Galatians 5. Uh, asking ourselves <clears throat> about the freedom that we have in Christ and do we experience this on a daily basis. So before we study, let's pray. Father in heaven, we humble ourselves in your presence and Rejoice in the freedom that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ as you sent your only begotten Son into the world to die for the sin of your people and to raise him from the dead. For he's ascended into heaven and sits at your right hand, ever living to make intercession for us. We thank you for the blessings you've given to us in our time of worship and pray that our worship has been acceptable to you. Fathers, we come to study your word. I pray that you'll keep the evil one from us, that you'll instruct us from your word by your Holy Spirit, the lessons that you want each of us to have today, that your children will be spiritually refreshed and renewed and encouraged. How I pray for those here today who do not know Jesus as their Savior. Oh, Lord, that you will work effectually in their hearts by your Spirit. Show them your grace mercy, love, and forgiveness in Christ. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let us stand for the reading of God's holy word. Galatians chapter 5, <clears throat> verses 1 through 15. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision... Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view. And the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettled you would emasculate themselves. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> What we're going to be looking at this morning, freedom in Christ. Freedom that we have in Christ and being made aware of those who would put us back in bondage. A bondage that none of us want to be in. So let's look at verse 1 of Galatians chapter 5. We're told for freedom Christ has set us free. We have been set free from what? That's the question. What have we been set free from? Binding 
legalism. Binding legalism. Any of you know any Pharisees? These are the people who are strict observers of the law. It's all what you do, how you perform, all the ceremonialism. It's the ceremonialism that's important, not Christ. There were a group of people that Paul is referring to here called Judaizers. And the Judaizers believe that, yes, you did have to have Christ as Savior, but you also had to obey the law, and part of that was being circumcised. Today we would say, okay, yeah, you have Christ as Savior, but you have to be baptized. And some would say you have to be immersed. Others say, no, sprinkling gets you covered all right. And then you begin to pile all these traditions as well on top of people in order for them to be saved or to be righteous before God. We need to see this morning exactly what it means to be free in Christ. Paul says here, for freedom Christ has set us free from all of that legalism and all of those traditions. So what do we do? And this is very important that we realize this. First of all, Paul says, you've been set free. So he says, stand firm, therefore. Stand firm in your freedom in Christ. There are two things that this verb, stand firm, means. First of all, it's steadfast. I like that word, steadfast. You're not moving me. I'm dug in. You're not moving me. I don't care who you are or what you're trying to move me off Christ. You're not going to work. The other meaning of being steadfast is to be stable. And that is very important that you and I are stable in our faith. Yes, Jesus is, is indeed the Son of God, truly God and truly man. Jesus did come into this world to die for the sin of his people. He did that. He shed his blood. He poured his life out. He was buried. And on the third day, he was risen from the dead. And he eventually ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. I believe it with all my heart. And I'm not moving. There's where I am and that's where I'll ever be. That's what it means to stand firm. Be steadfast. You're not moving me. And I'm stable. I know what I believe and I believe what I know. It's very important. We all have that understanding. And that as a result of that, look what Paul says in verse 1. Do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. In John 8, 36, Jesus is talking to Pharisees and they're trying to pile all this self-righteousness on people. And Jesus says, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And we are free in Christ. Every one of us here today who trust in Christ alone for salvation, you and I are free from all the traditions and all the legalistic ways of life. Don't go back into that. Now, in verses 2 through 6, Paul clearly states that salvation comes through Christ alone. And if we start piling on the ceremonies and start trying to be self-righteous instead of having the righteousness of Christ in us, then you've got to wonder, was I really saved to begin with? And so we have to be very careful that we're only in Christ alone. Now let's look at verse 6 of Galatians chapter 5. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Faith working through love. Faith. Remember what faith is. Faith is accepting the truth. The truth that Jesus is the Son of God and He came to die for our sins. The second part of faith is actually trusting in it. Committing your life to Christ. Asking for that forgiveness. So there's accepting truth and then there's trusting in the truth. 
And he says here in verse 6 that faith is working through love. Faith is working through love. Brothers and sisters, you know this. Faith is, is not a theological theory. It is real. When we trust in Christ, we are free from the bondage of sin and death and all the traditions. And our faith gets us through every day as we trust the Lord, not only for salvation, but for our sanctification, conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ, watching over us, providing for us on a daily basis. When we're facing difficult situations, we cry out to the Lord and He answers. His ear is open to the righteous and His eyes are upon us. And that's real faith. But notice that faith works through love. Now, let me ask you all something. Did, you, did y'all work in the yard yesterday or do anything? Y'all didn't do a thing yesterday. Why, why are you so tired today if you do that? Yeah, you were working, right? And when you worked yesterday, what did you expend? Energy. And you accomplished something. That's what the word work means. It means to expend energy. So faith is an active Real work going on in your life and in mine on a daily basis. You and I should be practicing our faith every day. Looking to the Lord for what we need. His direction. But look what it works through. Love. It works through love. Not law. But love. And the word love is agape. And you know the, the meaning of agape. It's a love of choice. It's a love of commitment. And it's a love of loyalty. And this is the faith working through love. And that's what faith is all about. And we're free from all the legalism. And we're free to love the Lord. We're free to love each other. Now, let's keep on going. This really gets even better Now, look at verses uh, 7 through 12. He talks about, uh, look at verse 7. You were running well. Y'all were doing great. You were walking with the Lord. You're running well. You're living your lives before the Lord. Who in the world messed you up? Paul's not real happy, by the way, in this. Who messed you up? Who caused you to start thinking otherwise? Brothers and sisters, you have got to be so careful who you listen to. Whether it's radio, TV, or in any pulpit, you better know the scripture. And don't listen to just anybody. Because they will put you back in slavery if you're not careful. You and I have to think with discerning minds of what we're being taught, which includes me. I'm not going to intentionally lead you astray. But there's only one perfect teacher that ever walked on this earth. And that was Jesus Christ. So we must listen with discerning minds. And we look at evangelical Christianity today. And the practices of the church and what the church is condoning. You better know the scripture. Or you and I can be led astray easily. So we're running well. We know the truth. And the truth has set us free in Christ. We're steadfast. We're going to remain there. Now let's look at verse 15. Well, no, let's go back up to uh, uh, 13. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom for an opportunity for the flesh... But through love, serve one another. Now you got the other extreme. You got this group over here, legalism and ceremonials and all this stuff. And you got this loosey goosey group over here, hyper grace. Oh, I don't have to obey the scripture. I'm under grace, not law. I can do anything I want to. Jesus Christ has covered it. That's an extreme of the legalism. When God created the man, 
in Genesis, recorded in Genesis 1 and 2. Did God just pat him on the back and say, Cheers, do what you want to? No, he gave him instruction. And in Genesis chapter 2, he said, Oh, by the way, you can eat anything in this garden, but you see that tree over there, the tree of, uh, of the knowledge of good and evil? Don't eat from that. Because the day you eat of it, you die. Well, we all know the rest of the story, don't we? It was disobedience to God and his word that plunged us into sin. And whenever you and I have this attitude of I'm in Christ and it's all covered and I don't have to obey the scripture, I can disobey and think you're going to get away with it? No, you're not. Be careful what you tell people that they can do. Let's think about this. Somebody comes to you, they're hurt and they're angry. And they're pouring their heart out to you. They, they have been legitimately hurt. And, you, and they say to you, I am so mad at them, I will never forgive them. And what do you say? I wouldn't either. What? You have just given them permission to be unforgiving? You got to be careful. We can be over here in this camp as well. So we have to be careful that just because we're believers and in grace doesn't mean we have permission and we take our liberty to sin against God. So what do we do? Well, this is where we look at verses 16 through 18. Look at verses 16 through 18. This is how we live in freedom in Christ. This is the only way we can do this. Look at 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Now, I want to give you the literal translation in the Greek because it's a little different and the emphasis is a little differently. Because when you read it in the English, but I say walk by the Spirit, the emphasis is on walking. But when you read it in the original language, it says by the Spirit walk. It changes the emphasis. The emphasis is on the prepositional phrase by the Spirit. And that, that by the Spirit, that prepositional phrase tells us the means by which we conduct our lives. How am I conducting my life? How are you conducting your life? And we'll see in here, is it by the flesh, my own desires, or is it by the Holy Spirit of God? So the means by which we walk in the freedom of Christ and live in the freedom of Christ is the Spirit of God in every believer. And the Spirit of God says, what are you thinking? What are you doing? You know that's not pleasing to the Lord. You know that's against His Word. Why are you doing that? That's called conviction. And when the Spirit of God convicts you and me, brothers and sisters, I implore all of us, we better listen and follow the Lord. So by the Spirit, we walk. Now, that, that phrase, we walk, uh, there is emphatic. It's a very strong phrase, which means we conduct our lives. And you take that prepositional phrase, by the Spirit, it means the Spirit of God is alive and powerful in you and in me. And we're listening to the Spirit and not to this world in which we live. And not to the desires of our heart, which will sometimes be deceptive if we're not careful. And so we walk by the Spirit. Notice what is promised to us. If we, by the Spirit, walk, you will not gratify the lust of the flesh. Now, look at this. It says here, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. 
The word will there means the desire of the heart. As a believer in Jesus Christ, we all have a desire of the heart to honor God, to love Him, to obey Him, to walk with Him on a daily basis. That's the desire of the heart of a believer. And this is how our hearts should be on a daily basis. So it says, we will not. Now you need to look at the word not. In the Greek, it's permissible to use a double negative in a sentence. In English, we do not use double negatives. Well, we should not use double negatives. Every now and then we say, there ain't no way, you know. That's when the flesh kicks in, right? Well, <clears throat> in the Greek, it's, it's proper grammar. And, and, and in that phrase, there is absolutely no way you and I will gratify the lust of the flesh. Now we go to the word lust. The word lust there is a very negative word, and it means to have a strong desire for that which is forbidden. We have a strong desire for that which is forbidden. I'll put it on, a, on a, an example we all can understand. I want to talk to the person who puts restaurants together and they put all the meat and vegetables up front and they put the desserts on the end. It ought to be the opposite way, right? Because all of us have a sweet tooth. Some have more than others. And we get to that dessert and you hear this voice saying, don't eat it, don't get that. What do you do? You get two. That's the desire. That's the desire. We all have it. It's real. But do we fight it? Do we gratify? Do we bring it to completion? The word gratify actually means to bring to completion. So when we have these desires that are very real, very powerful, and, and ungodly, do we cave in and complete that desire? Or do we say, no, no, I cannot do that. That is a sin against my Heavenly Father. And it's a sin against whoever. I will not do that. Lord, help me. Help me now. And we call out to the Lord immediately. We will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Flesh there uh, would mean in this context the old sinful ways that we all fight. Those desires, those thoughts. We all have them. We all fight them. And if we're conducting our life by the means of the Holy Spirit, we will fight. Now, let's go to verse 17. Look at verse 17. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Now, there are three words we need to look at. First of all, you see uh, the desires, the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. The desires of the spirit are against the flesh. Against, the word against is the same word in both of those phrases. And, you know, you and I can be against something and not be mean or hostile. Or we can be against something and we can be hostile. That word means hostility. So the flesh is hostile to the things of God. And the Holy Spirit is hostile to the things of the flesh. So you and I have a spiritual war going in us all the time. 
And sometimes it's stronger and more intense than others. It just depends on what we're going through in life. But there is a hostile force in us that's going constantly. Now we need to look at the word opposed because it says those are opposed to each other. That word also means hostility. So there's a lot of hostility spiritually that we're fighting with on a daily basis throughout the day. You ever gotten home at night and just worn out and you wonder why? There's a spiritual war going on in us. And it's a real war. Now the question is, whose side are we going to take? Whose side are we going to take? Are we going to side with the flesh knowing it's against God? Or are we going to side with the Holy Spirit? Which side are we going to take? The one you and I feed, the one you and I go to the most is going to be the strongest. It's going to win out. We all know that if a stray cat or dog comes to the house, what do you do? You lock it down, take all the water and food up, put it in the house. Because if you ever feed one, you just got yourself a pet. And that thing was, I mean, that, that dog or cat will stay there until whatever. And if you and I continuously feed the flesh, we get stronger in the flesh. And if we continue to go to the Spirit of God and walk by the Spirit of God, we get stronger spiritually. That's why, brothers and sisters, in creation, God set aside a day of worship for our spiritual strength and our spiritual renewal. And that's why you and I need to worship on the Lord's day faithfully and regularly for our own spiritual good and strength and to the honor and glory of our Heavenly Father. That's why we need to study His Word on a regular basis. That's why we need the body of Christ because we are told by Christ in Matthew that the uh, first commandment the greatest commandment is to Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. And the second one is like to it, love your neighbor as yourself. How do we get to know each other? And how do we get to love each other? It's through worship. It's through spiritual fellowship and communion in the body of Christ. That's, that's crucial. It has nothing to do with thou shalt worship. Get me out of that church. Oh, it's great to have you here today and mean it. It is so good to see all of you. Boy, I tell you, I can just walk into this sanctuary. And like Hunter says, we have to break y'all up. But it's good we have to break y'all up because you're talking to each other. You're getting to know each other. You're getting to know how to pray for and with each other. That's crucial in a church, in a body of Christ. That's what makes a body of Christ spiritually strong. But what happens if I get away from it? And I don't interact and I don't come regularly and I stand off. I'm isolating myself from the fellowship that I desperately need. Freedom in Christ means I should have a love for that. The love of God, that agape that God pours in our hearts. In, in Romans, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, we have this word, but God demonstrates His love toward us in that how, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God's already proven He loved us when He sent His Son into the world to die for our sins and raised Him from the dead. He has shown to every one of us 
how much he loves us. And then you go from verse 8, and I'm backing up a little bit here, and I understand that. In verse 5, we're told that it's the Holy Spirit that pours the love of God into our hearts. And as the Holy Spirit pours that love into you and me as believers, then we're to love, we're to serve one another through love. Why do I pray for you all? Simply because you're church members? Y'all are in trouble if that's the only reason I pray for you. I love you. I love being here with you. Worshiping with you. Crying with you. Laughing with you. Hurting with you. Rejoicing with you. That's a part of being the body. That's freedom. That's freedom in Christ. I walk into this sanctuary with you all. And I don't feel stilted and legalistic and I better dot this I and, and cross this T. I better be biblical now. I understand that. And we all do. But there's a love of Christ here. And we want to keep that love here. And we keep it by being free in Christ to keep it. Not because we have to, but because we want to. John 14, 15 is a very important truth in being free in Christ. Jesus says in John 14, 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, the verb there is the verb form of agape, agapao. And it's in the present tense. If you love me day in and day out, you will keep my word. You will desire. The, the word will and want means I desire. I want to keep your word. And then in Psalm 119, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Loving the Lord. I memorize scripture. You memorize scripture. Not to win Bible trivia games. Not to show off my knowledge. But we store the word of God in our hearts to love him. So we won't sin against him. That's freedom in Christ. That's freedom in Christ. Nobody likes a taskmaster. Nobody likes anyone that stands over them. You will do this. You better do that. Nobody wants that. You're enslaved to somebody like that. Christ is not like that. He wants your love. He wants our love. He wants us loving Him. Loving each other. Serving each other and serving Him. That's freedom in Christ. That's what that means. Freedom in Christ. I'm free to love. I'm free to help. I'm free to be helped. I'm free to be loved as well. Are you free in Christ? That's a question that we all wrestle with. Am I free in Christ? Yes, you are. You trust in Christ alone for salvation? You're free. You are truly free. But if you're trying to work your way into heaven... If you're trying to be baptized and if you're trying to trust in Christ and obey the law, that's a work salvation. You, you won't be there. It's only in Christ and Christ alone. Brothers and sisters, you're free in Christ. That bondage of slavery is gone. Love him. Walk with him. Worship and serve him. Love one another. Continue doing this. But if you're not sure that you're free in Christ, after this service, I want to talk to you. I want to show you the freedom you can have in Christ. And you will experience that personally on a daily basis. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we love you because you first loved us. Thank you, Father, for loving us, freeing us from this bondage of slavery, of legalism. And thank you for warning us about taking this to the other extreme to where we, 
we just do anything we want and that's not permissible so father i pray that you'll search the hearts of everyone here giving assurance to your children of that freedom in christ and father how i pray for anyone here today who's not sure about that freedom or doesn't even have it oh that you'll bring them to yourself through the lord jesus for it's in jesus name i pray amen